Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. Okay, we're going to get started. So welcome to Vela's webinar today, How Next Generation Sequencing for Drug Resistance Mutation Detection Affects HIV Treatment Choice. My name is Lindsay Rockefeller. I work in business development for Vela Diagnostics, and I'll be the moderator for today. Our webinar is scheduled for one hour, in which we'll hear from our two presenters, Dr. Ravindra Kole and Kisa Schott. During their presentations, if you have questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We'll have a question and answer segment after both our presenters have concluded. Our presentation is being recorded and will be sent out to attendees at a later date. So I'm so pleased to present Dr. Ravindra Kole. Currently, Dr. Kole is the Vice Chairman in the Department of Pathology at the Augusta University in Augusta, Georgia. He divides his time directing molecular pathology, cytogenetics, breast pathology, teaching, and research. He is the CLIA Laboratory Director for the Georgia Esoteric and Molecular Lab, and also serves as the Medical Director for the Cytogenetics Laboratory. His presentation is how NGS can give you more information on drug resistance data that will affect HIV treatment choice. He will also discuss the advantages of next generation sequencing, DRM identification, over Sanger sequencing methods, and how VELA's assay can easily be implemented in your lab based on his validation experience. So Dr. Kole, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, good morning, uh, welcome to the webinar. My name is Ravinder Kohli. I'm a pathologist at uh, Medical College Georgia at Augusta University. And uh, in the webinar today, I, my plan is to discuss next generation sequencing as a platform and its advantage uh, in looking at uh, the drug resistant mutations in HIV uh, virus and how does it affect in making treatment choice. So these are my relevant disclosures for the content that I'm going to talk about, but most importantly, the, the opinions expressed during the presentations are personal and does not uh, represent the opinions of Vela Diagnostics or my collaborators or my employer. For the next 30 plus minutes, my plan is to talk a little bit about the background information on HIV testing a brief introduction to infectious disease NGS as a new emerging uh, way of looking at these, these viruses. Uh, talk in depth about our validation experience and the assay content and, and design. And in the end, I want to uh, take a case-based approach in, uh, uh, in, in highlighting the utility of NGS uh, as, as a platform to identify the DRMs especially how does it affect HIV treatment choices. So the lab which I work on is a CLIA lab, uh, which is, our focus is mostly on looking at new platforms, new, new, new exciting technologies and uh, applying them for molecular and, and cytogenetics. Uh, and then we have a, very, a variety of people working in the lab from scientists to pathologists. We have uh, designed and developed most of these uh, the platforms and assays we work on in the lab, and a lot of them are, 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 are focused in two areas, uh, infectious disease and oncology. So a couple of slides on NGS as a technology for HIV virus sequencing. So if you look at NGS as, as a technology, there are the group in two major uh, buckets. One is your amplified single molecule sequences where you have alumni and life technology uh, instruments and, and what we like to call it a third generation sequencing where you're sequencing single molecule where we put our pack bio and Oxford nanotechnologies. Uh, the very upper level overview of uh, Sanger versus uh, deep sequencing 
status sequencing is phenomenal and it's very high specificity, uh, but what it lacks is, is identifying variants with less than 20% uh, allele frequency. So there's a good chance that when you're using Sanger sequencing as a method of your testing, you are going to miss a uh, few variants. Uh, they might be critical for patient care uh, with, with the lower allele frequency. On the other hand, when you're you know, sequencing uh, by using ultra deep sequencing technologies, uh, there's a good chance that you will identify those smaller variants with the smaller allele frequency. And that has been one of the great advantages in the recent times, especially when you're looking at oncology. And our experience based on oncology has been very positive by using uh, next generation sequencing or ultra deep sequencing as a method. And the whole exercise of adapting this platform uh, in, in infectious disease is, is what we can talk about in the next few slides. So, so I want to touch base with uh, and go a little bit in detail what are the, what are the contents and what attracted us to uh, this particular assay, especially coming from uh, an assay uh, which was an IVD and we were running for 10 plus years in lab. So anytime when you look at a new assay, you, so you look at this content and, and, and if you take a step back and look at uh, what exactly we are sequencing or what exactly we are testing. So as most of you know, more than 90% of HIV infections belong to the HIV M group and all the assays which are there are, are focused on sequencing this particular group of HIV-1 virus. And, and more importantly, if you're looking at the, the HIV life cycle and the retroviral drug targets, so there are seven different uh, processes we are interested in, uh, in, in HIV integration, replication, and infection. Out of those seven, I think the, there are four of them which we we know are involved in, in revolution of the, these viruses for uh, resistance to existing therapy. And out of those four, the three are regularly targeted uh, in any, any DRM-based assays. The three are your protease, integrase, and RT. So when we looked at the HIV, uh, the Vela Santosa HIV genotyping assay, the, the design concept, the target maps were the, the protease, RT, and integrase gene. There, there are two amplicons used, and the amplicon uh, lens was 1,500 base pair for protease and RT, and around 1,000 base pair for integrase. So just to give an, an uh, again, upper level overview of uh, what the assay looked like, uh, around 342 drug resistant mutations were looked at, uh, and you're looking at Coron 1 to 99 on protease, uh, Coron 1 to 376 on RT, and Corons 1 to 28 on integrase. Uh, so with all this information, again, this is, uh, I think, a two years old uh, exercise. Uh, when we looked at the assay as, we want, as, as something which we want to adapt early in the lab uh, for our patient care, we, we were coming back from uh, experience from uh, oncology and GS validation, and we thought that we could use that experience for validating uh, uh, an ID-based NGS assay. So we were one of the few early labs to take that exercise in the lab. So when you look at an NGS assay validation, there are CAP as well as AMP guidelines, and these guidelines are divided into three groups. Uh, you have a vet bench validation, a pipeline validation, and validation of the tools which are used for interpretation and reporting of the data. And one of the advantage, and I think it's a huge advantage of in uh, the Vela Santosa HIV assay is you buy everything from one individual vendor, which is Vela, and it makes a huge difference in a CLIA setting because if, if especially when we're coming from an oncology assay where we have to buy or purchase uh, different components of the assay from five or six plus vendors, uh, the validation and clinical uh, assay running becomes very difficult in a CLIA setting because if any of the component is not functional, then 
you really have to talk to each and every vendor. On the other hand, if each and every component or 100% of the components are provided by one vendor, uh, it becomes very easy uh, because if, if any of if the assay has some functionality issues, you can always blame just the one vendor. So it it became a very uh, eminent for us that we would we would easily cruise through this, especially with our experience from NGS uh, validation. So we divided that, and luckily, as I said, all these three components of the HIV uh, assay are provided by Vela in entirety. So, in in I just want to spend some slides on um, explaining what was our idea behind this uh, validation exercise long two two and a half years ago. So, anytime in a clear setting when you're bringing in a, a non-FDA assay, uh, there are five components. So. It, it, irrespective of NGS or non-NGS. So what you're looking at is uh, accuracy, precision, analytical sensitivity, specificity, and lower limit of detection. So basically, apart from uh, the three aspects of NGS, the wet bench, dry bench, and interpretation, all those three aspects need to have these five core performance characteristics uh, validated in a class setting before the assay goes live. So we basically took this challenge and identified a method so we could uh, validate all those three components uh, and the five core performance characteristics uh, in, in the assay in our lab. So for the validation, we, we have been doing this uh, HIV drug resistant test for 10 plus years on hundreds and hundreds thousands of samples we have collected in the lab over the last 10 plus years. So we went back to our archive, identified all the samples, and we had a few hundred CAP proficiency left our samples. We collected them and then started our validation process. So, but one of the things we we knew was that we're comparing, this is not an apples to apples comparison. This is a huge difference in comparison because the earlier technology was Sanger sequencing and now you're moving towards a more uh, sensitive technology, which again, is you're looking at 20% versus 5%. So our results were not very really surprising, uh, but that definitely made a huge difference in, in clinical application. So just to give you a matrix of our sample, we use around 72 known patient samples and six HIV cap proficiency Samples which were previously very well characterized by the virus seek Abbott IVD assays and uh, for this particular validation exercise. So, when we look at the actual variants which are being uh, covered in the Sentosa HIV genotyping assays, these are around 342 variants, which includes mutations and insertions. And then we design our patient sample matrix in such a way that we could cover the majority of these variants. So just to give you an example, uh, we had 21 NRTI drug-resistant mutations uh, in our validation, 25 NNRTI, and around 25 uh, PI drug-resistant mutations, and uh, a bunch of integrase drug-resistant mutations. So we, we put together all these matrix, and just to give you a summary of this, uh, this is uh, our validation uh, exercise data set as compared to what Vela uh, it was covering. So we knew we had a sufficient coverage uh, as a validation exercise for our assay. So uh, for the precision or what we call as a reproducibility and repeatability studies, we, we take these patient samples which are tested in the gold standard orthogonal methods and we run these samples within runs to assess the reproducibility and between the runs to assess repeatability. And this was done uh, by different, uh, at different time points as well as by different techs. So, and, and, and the assay does come with its own uh, claims. Um, for radiant calling, uh, you need to have median coverage of less, I mean, the, for assembly, the median coverage of less than 1,000 or more than 50, uh, more than 1,000 and, sorry, less than 1,000 and more than 50 was something which we looked at. 
and it needs at least a thousand X coverage to accurately detect mutations at five uh, VAF in patient samples. So, uh, and in the regions with less optimal coverage, it is the, the reporter is still able to call, make the call confidently, but it's reduced uh, according to the read coverage. So these are something with the manufacturer's claim, and we went with them, and. Using these claims, we were able to uh, look at our precision reproducibility and reputability data, and we had 100% uh, concordance between the variants which I showed you earlier uh, for intra-run, inter-run, as well as between the tech. So this was the beginning of our validation, and we're very uh, happy that uh, we could produce uh, such an excellent uh, uh, precision data on our clinical as well as uh, fast uh, cap proficiency sample. Uh, the next aspect of the validation was looking at the lower limit of detections. For the LOD studies, what we did was we created serial dilutions of samples with known viral load and uh, the DRM status. So just to give you an example, one of the patient samples, we started with known viral load of 2,000 and went as low as 100 uh, or copies per ml. and uh, we, the, these were uh, just one of the sample for LOD studies, and we, we identified uh, pretty much, uh, and you can look at, this is nothing different from what you could do on a, a previous Sanger sequencing, uh, as long as the variant had a very high lead frequency. And very similarly on the NGS assay, we were able to repeat that uh, with, uh, within the range about 100 starting from 2,200. So um, the, the LOD studies with a mixture of multiple samples, so we knew what our LOD uh, viral load value would be for uh, cutoff uh, for the clinical uh, testing. For accuracy, again, we basically were looking at all these different runs we have uh, created using patient sample as, as well as the cap proficiency samples. And, and CAP as well as AMP guidelines have very well, uh, very well documented methods how we should look into these studies. So the positive, the, the positive, the percentage positive agreement, the negative percentage agreement, as well as the positive predictive value and negative predictive value is calculated based on CAP and AMP guidelines. And and again, not to our surprise, uh, we have a we had a pretty much 100% concordance between our earlier assay and and the current assay, uh, the the NGS assay. And again, I mean, we we are not surprised because again, you're comparing from a Sanger, which is around 20% cutoff, to uh, uh, NGS assay with a 5% uh, cutoff. So, so this was our our. This is I mean this is this, this happened over a pretty uh, lengthy period of time, but I just wanted to give a brief uh, overview of the validation process, the sample matrix, and the performance of the assay in our hands. And uh, just to give you a timeline, uh, we we had the training in July and August of 2018, and after the training, training we were able to go. We finished validation in a couple of months, and we were able to go live in October of that particular year. So, uh, and then the and the major reason for getting a, a lab up and running within such a short period of time is number one, uh, it is provided everything. You're talking about extraction. Uh, I think in in the next speaker's presentation, you'll look at the workflow. And the entire workflow, 100% of the workflow, the extraction, the library prep, sequencing, and the reporter is provided by one vendor. And that makes a huge difference in the validation process as well as clinical testing uh, uh, because you, you could connect all the dots coming from the one person. And the second reason we could do something so quickly was a phenomenal uh, customer service as well as, uh, as a technical support from uh, Vela Diagnostic, I think, uh, was one of the very one of the fastest NGS validations we have done in the lab. And obviously, the third and most important reason we could do such thing quick because we had 
a pretty robust uh, NGS lab and our experience with NGS validation has been extensive. So all these three things made a huge difference in getting uh, a, a brand new platform, a brand new uh, application of NGS in infectious disease right from extraction to reporting uh, within a few months. So the, having it supported by one one vendor makes a huge difference if you're looking into uh, validation, now verification for this particular test. So after validation, we have, I think, more than 25 plus clinical runs. We have multiple, I think, uh, four plus cap proficiency testing with 100% concordance. So uh, we have been very happy overall with the, the, the performance of these uh, since we went live for clinical testing. Just to give you, uh, uh, overview of what you eventually end up looking at as a QC. I mean, I think the built-in QC with the, the, the SQ reporter on board is phenomenal. I think this is one of the things which makes uh, my life a lot easier as a lab director when I'm signing out these cases. So everything is very well put in uh, bioinformatically for as a QC review, the cluster density. You get two types of report. Again, I think this is very well out there, and I'll be happy to take any questions later or maybe uh, have another discussion rather than wasting or spending time on these uh, documents. So you get two reports. Mostly one is an in-detail report about everything which is covered and uh, the reads and the, the NGS uh, QC metrics. Uh, this, is, this is a report which talks about uh, and then on, on you get more of a clinical DRM type report, which is, uh, which is which we end up modifying and submitting it to our uh, ID folks. Uh, so this is the, the, the clinical DRM report, which goes on every target, what was the area targeted, the mutations detected, the drug names covered. And the, one of the advantage of uh, Vela as compared to the previous assays it did was it has uh, more than one database to comparison, uh, depending on your uh, ID consultant's uh, request. And, and also, on each and every variant or mutations they identified, uh, there is a, a comment to start with, which you can edit and uh, add your uh, interpretation to that. So for each and every uh, target, you'll get uh, that specific information about the detected mutations, the drug class, and based uh, the assessment based on different databases and the comments for those particular variants. Um, so th th this is how uh, the the DRM based reports look like. And and now I want to focus on the the important aspect of why why NGS makes a huge difference. <clears throat> So a couple of uh, uh, standard uh, advantages of NGS versus Sanger sequencing, and, and both of the technologies have uh, uh, a, their own advantage. I mean, I spent a lot of my time in my graduate school and postdoctoral work using Sanger sequencing, and it definitely has its advantage of being uh, cost-effective. It's relatively fast. I mean, there's nobody in in the research world or even molecular world doesn't know the uh, the workflow for Sanger sequencing. Uh, but the challenges of Sanger sequencing, uh, it's, it's the sensitivity is, is low, it, the LOD is around 15 to 20%. It has a low discovery power and is not as cost effective for high uh, number targets. And definitely the scalability is very low. And then when you're looking at the targeted NGS, what uh, this HIV uh, Vela assay is, you have higher sequencing depth and enable us to go high sensitivity. Uh, the cutoff here is 5%. It also has a high discovery power. You're definitely going to identify new variants, which you will be missing out on Sanger. The resolution is higher. Uh, the more data is produced with the same amount of DNA or RNA input, and it has a high uh, sample throughput. But the disadvantage of uh, targeted NGS is it's less cost effective and it's more time consuming uh, for sequencing a low number of targets. But one of the advantages which we realized was uh, 
the reporting at the end is, is relatively painless in in, in uh, the HIV NGS uh, Santosa reporter as compared to earlier uh, Sanger-based sequencing, and that makes that made my life as a lab director a lot easier. Uh, again, the, the same uh, summary which I gave earlier about th these are very general advantages of uh, uh, NGS as a technology. So I want to go over a couple of cases. And again, just to summarize, during a validation, we used 72 clinical cases which were earlier tested on uh, Sanger sequencing or, or your standard method. Uh, uh, and, and again, you're looking at a very sensitive new technology, so you are definitely going to get new additional information on each and every sample, and we do see this in oncology setting also. So, but it does, does it mean that each and every mutations you identified is actually clinically relevant or not, and I think that's the critical point. So again, we, each and every sample which we used during our clinical validation, we identified additional uh, mutations, and majority of them were associated with DRMs. And again, you'll, the, the critical, the, the argument is that these are the variants which are less than 20 or 15 percent elite frequency. So just to give an example, this is one of the cases uh, in our validation setting where you are looking at uh, uh, earlier uh, sequencing, and 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 the NGS definitely identified new additional variants which made uh, uh, pretty significantly useful. So just if, if you're aware of all these variant types and its clinical application, so if you're looking at L889V. Uh, and its, its clinical applications are very well listed. So these are not just mutations which we are just found because it, this, the, you're sequencing more regions or you're sequencing uh, more sensitive way, but these sequencing uh, technologies, or these variants definitely have clinical applications uh, based on the database analysis uh, we have performed. So this is just a one of the cases, and here you, should, here you realize that we have around four uh, variants we identified with clinical significance. And this is another case where, where we've identified a couple of variants uh, which had clinical utility uh, and use uh, based on the NGS technology. And I, I can go over in detail if, if after the call if anyone is is interested, and I'll be happy to share the slides and go over these variants, which are very well characterized uh, in the in the, in either of the three databases which we use. So this is another case which we identified a, a new non-polymorphic accessory mutation in the uh, in the NRTI, and and again, apart from being clinically relevant, we also had identified new variants and new mutations which will be contributed towards uh, our, our knowledge of these variants, and then uh, these depositories in future will help us uh, claim or uh, uh, understand better the, the DRM and its clinical application. So at this, given mo at this given moment, we are much more focused on what we identified new and are clinically relevant. But I'm definitely sure in the future we will be talking about the new variants, which at this moment are not clinically uh, relevant, but might definitely add our collective uh, knowledge on these variants uh, in the near future. So this is another uh, example of uh, a case where uh, this is, again, all validation retrospective studies, and we identified a new variants which are clinically relevant. So and then I think uh, this is the last case where we identified two variants, uh, which were again uh, involved in NRTI as well as NNRTI uh, DRMs, uh, and, and these are very well established variants in our in the database. So, in in summary, uh, uh, the the results of the validation study shows that the the entire platform. Uh, as well as the panel is pretty robust, uh, and what 
really helped us was we had 100% concordance on retrospective CAP proficiency testing, and that, that made not only the clinical sample as well as the CAP proficiency testing samples uh, pretty robust for the assay. So uh, the assay benefit, it was relatively simple protocol as compared to what we were used to on other oncology NDS protocol. Uh, and the, the, all the reagents were integrated. The, the built-in bioinformatics helped us to implement this rapidly. I mean, it was nothing as compared to what we were struggling with on oncology-based NGS assay. Uh, the reproducibility and all other uh, uh, parameters of CLIA validations were very strong. Uh, and then the variant detection uh, was really, really good on orthogonal IVD methods. Uh, it would work really well in challenging samples with the viral load was less than 1,000. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it has very robust inbuilt QC data for visualization. and that made my life as lab director uh, very, very easy. Uh, so I could look at the QC uh, for the, that particular run, compare the QC f for different runs, uh, and then look at the QC for individual samples before I sign out. And the sign out was also relatively painless because of the built-in bioinformatics uh, in, in the assay. So, uh, I really like to thank a couple of people from Vela, uh, Tim, Keisha, Lindsay have been really helpful during the validation as well as currently right now. Dennis from the bioinformatics side. A uh, couple of people from my lab, uh, Ashish is a lab supervisor and has done a phenomenal job with this validation. Barb and Alka, who are scientific directors, uh, also a major part of the validation process. Uh, Suda is, is the lab tech in Yasmin uh, who pretty much run these things clinically. And I have a group of other postdoctoral fellows who uh, help us with the protocol uh, as well as QC data. So thank you all. Uh, I'll take it back to uh, Keisha. Thank you, Dr. Kolei. Uh, so again, I know, I think we had a couple of questions come in. Dr. Coley will remain on the line and help answer. If you have any more questions for him, please feel free to ask. Our next segment is by Kisa Schott. She is going to present about Vela's recent FDA authorized Sentosa SQ HIV-1 genotyping assay. Kisha is a field application scientist at Vela Diagnostics USA. She has an MS in biotechnology, specializing in bioinformatics. She has 11 years experience in molecular diagnostics, and that includes four years experience in next generation sequencing technologies. Keisha has been a part of our team for the past year and a half. And before working for Vela, she conducted design research and validation of NGS assays for a diagnostic laboratory. So Keisha, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Um, and thank you, Dr. Kohle, if that was an excellent job for going over the REO version of our assay. Uh, but I wanted to take the opportunity to share some of the features um, of an assay that we've released recently. Uh, this version uh, that I will go over is authorized by the FDA for next generation sequencing of HIV-1 genotyping and drug-resistant mutations. So our goal as a company at Vela is to make complex molecular diagnostic processes attainable for every lab. We offer sample to result solutions that include the reagent and consumables, the instruments and analysis and reporting, all of that Dr. Coley just referred to. Our instruments include a single automated platform that is capable of running the sample extraction, the PCR setup, the library preparation, isothermal amplification and sequencer chip loading. Benefits of our system include the elimination of R&D development time and custom training of complex molecular techniques to lab personnel of varying experience levels. We also offer fast verification time with guided assistance in design and real-time troubleshooting. One of the benefits of a single company providing the full sample to result solution is our ability to fully troubleshoot issues as they arise. 
We are currently very excited about our FDA authorized HIV NGS assay, which performs the genotyping and subtyping of the viral strains and integrates the Stanford HIV database to indicate drug resistant mutations and their susceptibility. As Dr. Coley mentioned, our assay is targeted next generation sequencing and it covers the protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase regions of the pool gene. This wide coverage allows us to indicate drug resistant mutations in the beneficial integrase region that is often excluded from other assays. This large target also allows us to easily update the analysis portion of the assay and incorporate, le incorporate newly determined DRMs without redesigning the wet lab portion. So here's a quick snapshot of the workflow on our system. On the top row in, in green, you can see the list of steps for the assay with the corresponding time below it. Below that, you can see the equipment that is needed for the particular step. As you can see, a single automated platform, the Sentosa SX101, performs all the steps, everything from sample extraction through sequencer chip loading with an interim off-board PCR step. The samples then move to the Sentosa SQ301 sequencer, which is our modified DX version of the ion torrent PGM. Then the data is sent to servers with a custom built pipeline that parses and analyzes the sequences and produces reports for the overall run and for each sample. All of these instruments communicate with each other using our Sentosa software, and that provides traceability for both the samples and the reagents throughout the run. In the reagents row along the bottom, you can see the list of individual kits that we provide to be used for each step of this test. All of these items together make the comprehensive Sentosa workflow. This assay is FDA authorized from a de novo application. It runs on 730 microliters of plasma and targets the protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase regions. Our QC metrics are 1,000x median coverage for genotyping and variant calling, with sensitivity down to 20% variant frequency, with samples at 1,000 copies per mil. And then it goes down to 10% at 5,000 copies per mil and 15% at 15,000 copies per mil. And that's with a variant correctness at 98.4%. We were able to detect the listed group M subtypes throughout reactivity, interference, um, studies with no carryover com contamination between the runs. This assay can hold 24 samples per run, and there are two required controls, so that means you can run 22 patient specimens. Our system control acts as a no template control, and then our positive control contains 10 spiked in DRMs across the gene target that must be identified in order for the QC metrics to pass. In addition, there's an extraction control that is spiked into each sample to isolate individual sample inhibition and extraction failure. The total test turnaround time is about two days with about two hours of hands-on time. Our automation design includes the Sentosa SX101 instrument, which I mentioned before, and the Sentosa SQ reporter, which analyzes the data and issues three reports for each sample. The drug resistance interpretation is based on the Stanford HIV drug resistance database, which will be updated as new variants of clinical significance are identified. Also, raw data from each sample can be downloaded in the form of BAM, VCF, and FASTA files for external analysis if desired. While this test can be run in 24 hours in a lab with multiple shifts, a single shift lab can still produce results with a two day workflow as seen in this timing breakdown. As you can see, the amount of hands on time for each step is minimal, representing instrument setup time or sample and reagent preparation for each step. Both the library preparation and the sequencing and data analysis steps can be run overnight with no user intervention. With this two day setup, runs can be staggered in order to complete up to four runs per week on one set of instruments. After automated bioinformatic analysis is complete, there are three types of reports that are generated. Here you see an example of the quality control report, which runs through all of the QC metrics. 
the QC report is broken down into overall run QC and then sample specific QC. The QC status is indicated as a pass fail for easy interpretation. In addition, the QC report will indicate the reagent and the instrument traceability and list the software tools and the version for analysis. The genotyping report gives detailed information on the context amplified, the genotyping and subtyping identified, as well as the mutations discovered. Finally, we have the drug resistance interpretation report, which breaks down the susceptibility level based on the mutations identified in the HIV strain using the Stanford database. This report is separated by the gene targets, then by the individual drug therapies and it's color-coded for easy interpretation. You can see in this report indications of susceptible and then low and high level resistance in the assessment column. In addition to our HIV assay, we produce and are developing a wide variety of other precision medicine solutions, including assays for HCV genotyping, and NGS virology multiplexing, which includes HIV, HCV, CMV and HBV. We also are working on tests for microbial identification, oncology panels, and hereditary cancer screening. For more information, please visit our website at www.veladx.com and to be connected to one of our sales associates, please email us at info.usa at veladx.com. Thank you. Um, so I believe at this time, um, Q&A, if anybody has any questions, the, there's a Q&A button um, that you can enter your questions in for both Coley and myself, and we will answer um, whatever comes through. Dr. Coley, it looks like we have a couple of questions for you. Go ahead. Uh, the, first, the first being, is there a minimum number of cases that should be used for validation for statistically power significant? Right. So the, the answer for that question, I think uh, it depends on what assay you're using. Uh, the current assay for the Vela NGS is FDA cleared. So at this moment, you basically, are, what you're doing in a CLIA lab is you're going to verify a manufacturer's claim, and that is a very straightforward process. But if for any reason, if you're going to use the RU assay, uh, then in that setting, you will have to do a thorough validation. And and you have, uh, we have a CAP, College of American Pathology, and Association of uh, Molecular Pathology guidelines uh, and papers uh, which suggests at least use of 59 cases, but the idea of using those cases is you need to have a, a thorough coverage of all the variants which are included in the assay. So you could have one case with uh, one variant or we could have one case with 25 variants. So it's not just a question of number of cases, but it's also a question of getting the cases with thorough coverage of all the variants to get a good statistical uh, power of significance. So, so at least to answer the question based on the guidelines for oncology, you, you, you can at least start with 59 cases, but more number of the cases are better. Uh, but having cases with more complex variants is actually increases the strength of your validation. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, thank you. Say, so, um, Another question is, what is the percent variant detection rate set by the IVD software? Keisha, did you want to comment since this is an FDA 
question? Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I was having technical difficulties. Can you, can you repeat that question, please? What is the percent variant detection rate sent by the IBD software? Uh, so it will uh, detect down to 5%, but again, um, that depends on the, the median coverage that you see. Uh, so, and Dr. Coley mentioned this in his presentation as well. It's, it's fairly consistent between the FDA and our UO, um, but as long as you have a, a high enough coverage, you can go down to 5% variant frequency. Um, so that will actually be reported, but there are uh, variants that can be detected lower than that, but that's what we would actually see. Thank you. Dr. Cole, I have another question for you. Uh, what is the significance of Vela's 5% cutoff versus Sanger's 20% cutoff? So uh, given the extreme variability of HIV and its ability to replicate as a complex viral population, the HIV variants with reduced susceptibility to the, these antiviral drugs may represent as minority members of the viral species. So therefore, these patients with uh, this un undetectable resistance by standard methods may fail antiviral therapy, especially when you're looking at 14, 15% allele frequency is pretty significant. So uh, perhaps due to the presence of these minority HIV variants, uh, Next generation sequencing produces an enormous amount of information that allows the detection of these smaller uh, minority HIV variants at uh, at levels which we are not able to do with the standard uh, Sanger sequencing. So to answer your question, I think the 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 Sentosa HIV genotyping assay is calibrated even in the RUR FDA setting to look at variants uh, more than 5% or equal to 5%, especially if you have a 1,000x coverage. And because of that, these assays are more sensitive for detection of these low abundance amino acid variants. Uh, and then if you look at uh, the, the mean is around 3.4 additional mutations and around uh, 0 0.7 additional DRM per sequence. So it, it is a, uh, and then again, this is the overall commentary on the platform rather than assays. So when you're moving from something which is uh, standard is 15 to 20% to 5%, you definitely are gonna add a huge information to your reports. And but the key thing is not only it adds information, but it also affects our, our uh, clinical decision making. Thank you, Lindsay. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, so I think we'll have time for another question. Uh, for Dr. Cole, how has your ID docs reacted to the inability of the test to, t to detect drug resistant variants in potential treatment failure cases at low viral load, specifically below 1,000 copies per mil? So, uh I think uh, probably the question is ability rather than inability, if, if I understand correctly. Uh, in the past with, with our Sanger sequencing, the challenge was, there are two challenges, obviously the, the viral load less than particular number and uh, uh, the viral load and then the allele frequency less than 20%. So that, that we were able to look with our validation. So I, I know the, the manufacturer's recommendation is around 1,000 uh, copies, but if you, if you look at the validation data I presented, we were able to replicate a lot of these variants as low as 100 copies. So uh, that, that has not been a challenge uh, with our validation. But what advantage we were able to get is, is to look at variants with lower frequency. I hope that answers the question. 
Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Keisha, can you comment on the average throughput of samples run using Vela compared to the current run rate used by laboratories? Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, each laboratory is going to have a, a different uh, throughput for each individual sample, especially depending on what their current technology is. Um, I, the throughput that we see, um, so that's, that's an interesting word. So when we say throughput, we mean the number of copies that you see per sample. So we'll see in the hundreds of thousands or millions for an individual sample for a throughput of the number of sequences that are read per sample. Um, so I don't know if that's specifically what the question is getting at or if it's the number of samples. Um, uh, for the number of samples, the RUO version has, uh, can test up to 16 samples and the FDA version can do up to 24 samples a run. Um, again, there are controls and so that cuts that number down to, to 15 and 22, but um, so that, that's kind of both sides depending on which throughput this person was just asking about. Uh, Dr. Coley, are you planning to switch over from the RUO to IVD version? Uh, I think eventually, yes. Uh, so the, at this moment, uh, we are continuing what we have done, especially with our validation data. Uh, technically, we are running the version 2 uh, software and the test, which is very similar to what the FDA cleared is, and once we put together the rest of the components, we will eventually move to FDA approved. Thank you. Um, we have a question that is asking, did anyone compare the error rate between ion torrent and alumina? I'm guessing that's going to me, or Dr. Coley, do you have any any info on this? No, sorry. I, I mean, this is a very open question. Sorry. Are they talking about any particular assay or as a platform? I think there's publications and documents uh, available as a platform, but I don't think the assay is very specific for iron torn, so I don't have any comments for that. Uh, yeah, so our, our assay is very specific for ion torrent. Um, so, and you can't just take an ion torrent assay and run it on Illumina. So it's not going to be an apples to apples comparison. Um, but as Dr. Foley mentioned, there are studies out there that do compare the two different platforms. So, um, yeah, there are definitely papers that, that you can read up on the differences between the two. Uh, another question, does Vela recommend re-baselining patients if a lab changes from their current genotype method to a next generation sequencing assay? So I think this is a, this is a great question. I think this, this was something which we uh, had thought about and in, in constant with our ID folks uh, decided to go on with this assay. And this, this arises in any test where you're looking at uh, moving from a low sensitivity to high sensitivity assay. So to answer that question, I think uh, it's, not, it's not never going to be in any capacity for a manufacturer to recommend and make any of those changes. But I think it's going to be the lab and the, the the physicians who are going to take care of these patients to come up with some kind of a, a change algorithm from low sensitivity to high sensitivity testing for at least the initial conversion, and then later on move uh, to that particular uh, newer high sensitivity assay. I know this is a very general answer, but I think this is going to be an institutional policy rather than recommendation coming from uh, Vela or recommendation coming from one particular lab.
Okay, thank you. Um, we are oh, just at the one hour mark. Uh, so I think for today, we are going to wrap this up. Um, any questions that have not been answered that were in the Q&A, we will get to uh, via email. So I just wanted to say a thank you to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. A special thank you to Dr. Cole and Keisha, our presenters. We at Vela greatly appreciate everyone's time. Uh, we hope you found this session to be informative and have a wonderful day and enjoy your weekend. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you, everyone.